Hi, and welcome to Desert Foothills United Methodist Church Online. I'm Pastor Kristen Hansen, and it is so good to have you join us this week. If you'll go to desertfoothills.org, our website, you're able to register your attendance with us and let us know where you're joining us from. Also, uh, you can share your prayer request and you can give a donation and offering. Uh, you can find out what we're doing as a congregation about our Bible studies, uh, the mission work that we're doing and how you can partner with us. So I invite you to join us now for worship. Thank you, Andy, for bringing us that wonderful uh, song this morning. Um, Andy always is bringing us uh, some wonderful music. He works very hard to find music that we can share online. Um, I know, Andy, you've been doing a lot of stuff that's public domain, stuff that is uh, uh, stuff that is kind of ancient, traditional music, and you've been working on a lot of your music at home. Is that right? Yes, I have. Yeah, he's been working up a lot of new songs, I understand, too. Yeah, lots of new repertoire, yeah. Yeah, this is so an opportunity we, for me to, you know, we're all at home. It's an opportunity for me to do some, some work on new pieces. Yeah. Well, we certainly appreciate your gifts of music, and uh, we're thankful. It reminds us of the gifts that we have, too, and to be eternally grateful and thankful for what God shares to us in the world and when people like you are willing to use their gifts uh, in our world. So thank you very much for that. Heavenly Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. God, you are the three in one, the creator of all things, the Redeemer, our Jesus Christ, the Sustainer, the Holy Spirit, that uh, these three different parts of God that we read throughout all of scriptures, the whole of the gospel and our Old and New Testament together as a table that's spread before us, uh, a feast of your holiness and your faithfulness and your righteousness. God, we are thankful this morning as we come to you carrying our prayer requests, carrying all of those things that uh, we have in our hearts and in our homes, in our families, in our lives, in our communities. And God, we are um, joyful. We are sad. We are resilient and we are completely and utterly broken. We know, God, as we join together from all of our different places, whatever we've been feeling this week, uh, just like the psalmists would say to us, that you truly meet us in every one of our emotions and every one of our uh, feelings and every one of our places that we experience and from every kind of uh, situation that we find ourselves in. We find the comfort from the psalms reminding us that we're never alone, that God is with us always, no matter what, from beginning to end, Alpha and Omega, the God who is in all times and in all places and in all ways, and the God who goes before, the God who is thereafter. We uh, take comfort in these things, and yet sometimes they also feel so far and so foreign to us. God, we pray so deeply this morning for your presence to be something that we can uh, that we can experience, even for just fleeting moments in life. We pray that we are able to open our eyes and experience the beauty of the the nature around us, the amazing change of age as we grow, watching children be born into this world and watching those grow up 
into uh, human beings that are uh, equals to us and next to us. God, we, we pray today as we read the scriptures and as we uh, meet with your people and we lift up our hearts and our souls to you, God, uh, praying for you to help us to open ourselves more to what you teach to us. Help us to examine ourselves and make changes in who we are. Um, we are not designed to be a finished people, but a people of ongoing work, a people of ongoing learning, of ongoing loving, of ongoing and ongoing perfection that you call us towards. God, may we never be satisfied with who we are and where we are, but may we be going on towards what you call us towards. We remember all these prayers that we have lifted up today, and we, we think of all of these people on this Labor Day weekend who are with and without jobs. We're thankful for the work of our hands that we can do, for the hobbies that we uh, keep ourselves occupied and busy with, for retirement times, for times before work, uh, where children can be children. And we're thankful that we live in a nation where uh, we hold those things up as important. God, help us on this Labor Day weekend to be grateful for what we have and also to continue to work towards something better than what we experience in our world. God, we also pray this morning uh, for remembering that this week uh, we have suicide prevention week and this month is also suicide prevention month uh, internationally and and God during this time uh, each year we reflect and we think back over what you have done uh, in our world and and we think back over those who continue to pray uh, for their loved ones for those who lose hope for those who can't find themselves anymore God help us in this time. Help us to love, help us to notice, and God help us to support uh, those in our lives who are in need of uh, a friend, a person to come alongside of them. Help us live our prayers and not just pray them. God, in all of these things, we lift up your name and we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus Christ, amen. And friends, um, I want to invite you to gather together the elements that you have uh, for communion. Uh, you may have some uh, uh, something like bread or a cracker that you have. Uh, perhaps you have a uh, some water or juice, whatever you have uh, during this time. I want to invite you to go and get those things as we pre prepare for communion. Uh, we are online creating our own table, our own feast that God has given to us. And sometimes we may forget when we're in the sanctuary that this is a feast. This is um, not just a small bite of something, but this is a feast of all that God offers to us. And, and we commemorate it. We, we don't just commemorate, we experience it uh, on a weekly ongoing basis. Uh, remembering what God has done for us and continues to do for us and how we participate in this. This is the invitation that God uh, extends to us to the table, just like the hospitality of inviting someone over to your home. Uh, God is inviting you over to God's home uh, during this kind of communion time. And so uh, we remember this morning, we remember how Jesus was with his friends the disciples at the table having dinner and it was the last time that they would uh, all be gathered together like this. Matthew 26 from the message says that during the meal Jesus took and blessed the bread and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take and eat this is my body and then taking the cup and thanking God he gave it to them and said drink this all of you this is my blood God's new covenant poured out for people for the forgiveness of sins. And so I want to invite you to bless our meal uh, and, and to raise your elements up, to lift your elements up uh, together as we, as we pray this prayer together. 
And you can unmute yourself also if you have a free hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you'd like to repeat after me. Inviting God. Inviting God. Inviting God. Open, our open our hearts. Open our hearts. Our hearts. As we open our mouths. As we open, As we our, open mouths. our mouths. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with your peace. And make us whole. And make us and whole. Make us whole. Yes. In Jesus Christ we pray. In Jesus Christ we pray. Christ we pray. Amen. 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 And let's say that word together as we lift up our elements and say grateful. 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 And you can go ahead and partake of those elements now. And as we do, uh, I want to invite you to uh, extend our feast not just from the table, but also uh, the feast of the word of God uh, from the beginning uh, in Genesis all the way through Revelation. We have this feast, a table that is literally spread out for us from God uh, and a wonderful metaphor of the Bible that we will feast out of today. And uh, somewhat, Psalm 149 is, uh, you know, the Psalms, of course, are like the hymns of their day. So the book of Psalms is kind of like a hymnal that we would pick up. But uh, we often don't think of it that way because we read through it and we use words. So today I'm going to ask Shirley to sing it instead. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go Shirley. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go Shirley. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but, you know, these were meant to be sung. That's how they really, really originally were. Uh, they were meant to be sung. They were call and response often. Uh, some of them were sung as solos. Um, we don't know what it really sounded like exactly. You know, we, we have all kinds of wondering about that and guesses about that. Uh, in fact, lots of our psalms, as you read through them, you'll read musical directions. Like it'll say, to the chorister, you know, to the leader of the chorus. Um, it'll have musical directions in there, like Selah. Um, and it'll have a uh, call and response. You'll notice in some of our psalms, we have uh, parts that are repeated over and over again. You know, the steadfast love of God we hear over and over again in, in the psalms. Well, that's so people could, could easily remember them and, and uh, could say them together also. So we have 150 psalms, and this is number 149. Originally, they didn't have numbers either. They just knew it. And how they would know it is, like Shirley's about to do, she, the person would start singing it, and uh, they would recognize the words, and then they would know which one it was. So they didn't say, okay, let's everybody sing together Psalm 149 or, or hymn 149. They would just know it, kind of like in, in church, when we start singing a song, you start to hear as the piano starts to play, and you just know what that song is without even hearing a word, right? That's what it was like for them. They would hear it, and they would just know uh, that this song what it was about and what their part was in it. And they, they were a community. So we're hearing the, some of their contemporary music, uh, contemporary uh, music of that time. And so this is Psalm 149. Uh, and it was intended to accompany a festival dance. It was a celebration song, was pretty upbeat for all of these uh, psalms. This was not one of the laments, you know, that uh, would rail against God. This is one of those exciting uh, things, and it even has, uh, well, I'll, I'll let Shirley read it, uh, because this is a, a good one. Think about it. So in your, in your mind, kind of think about when you hear this, uh, the excitement, uh, the, the joy, um, all the fun in it. As you hear these words, this is an exciting, joyful song that they would have been singing. So Shirley, I invite you to come and to share our scripture with us. Okay. <clears throat> One through four, hallelujah. Sing to God a brand new song. Praise him in the company of all who love him. Let all Israel celebrate their sovereign, sovereign creator. Lion's children exalt their king. Let them praise his name and dance. Strike up the band and make great music. And why? Because God delights in his people, festoons, plain folks, with salvation garlands. So let true lovers break out in praise. Sing out from wherever they're sitting. Shout the high praises to God. Brandish their swords in the wild sword dance, a portent of vengeance on the God-defying nations, a, single that, a signal that punishment is coming. The king's chained and hauled off to jail, their leaders behind bars for good, the judgment on them carried out to the letter, and all who love God in the seat of honor. Hallelujah. 
And uh, one of the things that you heard in there, I, I love in this, in other versions, uh, instead of from wherever they're sitting, uh, it says, uh, let them sing joy on their couches. Isn't that appropriate for us right now? <laughs> wherever you are, uh, sing joy from those places of rest even. Um, our next scripture continues uh, from an earlier source. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, this next scripture, I've got myself, I've got to exit full screen. There we go, sorry. Uh, the next scripture we have comes from an earlier story is about Moses. Uh, now, remember Moses was the Hebrew child who was floated in the Nile to escape genocide and was scooped out by the daughter, the granddaughter, I'm sorry, of Pharaoh. And then she took Moses and raised Moses as her own in the family of Pharaoh. So he was a part of the Pharaoh's tradition and the family. Uh, the book of Exodus has two of the most critical experiences of the people of God in the formative years of faith. It was the liberation from Egypt and the covenant with God that was made. Um, so you see in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, um, and this month, if you want to read the book of Exodus uh, to go along with this stuff, uh, uh, it's a good time to do that. We see freedom and we see community that's being shaped in all of this. So Moses laid down the traditions of the faith uh, in what you're about to hear, and these became the hallmarks of faith in God. So we're about to pick up in the reading. This is after the plagues have happened uh, on the people of Egypt. Um, and they, this is before the people are actually leaving Egypt, before Pharaoh chases the people of God across the desert and right into the sea. Uh, so this is the origin story that you're about to hear of Passover. Uh, you'll remember this is uh, the words that God gives to them, the actions that the people are supposed to do uh, to prepare them to leave from Egypt and uh, it's kind of like, uh, this is the turning point in the story. Uh, this is what happens the night before everything just opens up. Uh, so we go to uh, Exodus 12, and uh, Jeremy, I'm coming over to you. There we are. Would you read for us our scripture? This, the scripture today is Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14 from the Message Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. God said to Moses and Aaron, while still in Egypt, this month is to be the first month of the year for you. Address the whole community of Israel. Tell them that the tenth of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, a lamb to a house. If the family is too small for a lamb, share it with a close neighbor, depending on the number of persons involved. Be mindful of how much each person is to eat. The lamb must be a healthy male, one year old, and select from either the sheep or the goats. Keep it and until the 14th day of the month and then slaughter it. The entire community of Israel would do this at dusk. Me. Take some of the blood and smear it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which you eat. You are to eat the meat roasted in the fire that night along with the bread made without yeast and bitter herb. Don't eat any of the raw or boiled in water. Make sure it is roasted. Whole animal, the head, the legs, the innards. Don't leave any of it until morning. If there are leftovers, put them in the fire. And here is how you are to eat it. Be fully dressed with your sandals on and stick in your hand. Eat in a hurry. Pass over to God. I will go through the land of Egypt on this night strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, whether human or animal, and bring judgment on all gods of Egypt. I am God. Blood will serve as a sign on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass you over you. No disaster will touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This will be a memorial day for you. You will celebrate it with a festival to God. On through the generation, a fixed festival celebration to be observed always. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for reading that today, uh, and Shirley also for reading our scriptures this morning. Um, 
Now in this, uh, this scripture that we have today, you may have heard this before. You may have participated in a Passover meal before. Um, with, a, with a show of hands, uh, who has ever participated in a Passover meal before? Yeah, I see a lot of you have, have done that. Um, so a Passover meal is uh, really interesting. You've probably heard this before. If you read this, uh, you may feel like it's a little dry. Uh, to read even. I mean, it's it's interesting, but it's a lot of details uh, that don't really matter that much to us now. I mean, unless we're going to actually do a Passover meal, uh, which usually falls right before Easter in that time, you know, the Lenten time before Easter, uh, you don't pay a lot of attention to this and how we cook today and what we do. Uh, but this was, um, this passage that falls in this grand story is incredibly revolutionary and radical. Uh, and I want to point that out for us today. This is probably the most in-your-face act that uh, God has uh, laid out for these people. And basically, uh, it, you're going to take their God and slaughter it. Okay, that's the punchline here. Um, now, this, uh, this Passover meal, they're going to, uh, the Egyptians, if you remember, they worshipped uh, Ra, the God of the sun. And there's a, an important history here because uh, Ra was also yoked with another god, or like they kind of joined and became one one god with another god who was uh, went by the name of um, Amon or Amon. Uh, it was an ancient Egyptian god of the sun and air, and so it became known as um, uh, Amon god, Amon Ra, and it was kind of the supreme god in the Egyptian worship. It was above all their other gods that the Egyptians worshipped at the time. And uh, this, the symbol, the metaphor, and when you see this, um, the Amun god was the ram. Uh, it was, you know, the full-grown adult male uh, ram. And you would often see it in human form with the ram's head. Uh, and uh, so, so basically what's happening here to worship God, what God is laying down to Moses and Aaron at this point, is that you are going to eat the people, the Egyptian, your oppressors, uh, you're going to eat their God in front of them. This is how you will deal with the oppression that these people are putting upon you. Now, that's revolutionary. You know, that's a radical action to eat the God of your oppressor. Uh, and that's literally what is happening here. Um, now, the people were aware of this, too. They were aware that it wasn't just here that God is telling them to do something like this, uh, that their, uh, their practices as the people of God went against the Egyptians. Because if you go back at, before this, four, four chapters before this in Exodus 8, uh, verse 26, Moses is saying to the Pharaoh at that time, Pharaoh is saying, why don't you do your practices right here in Egypt? Why do you have to go out into the wilderness to do them? And uh, at the time, the Pharaoh says to them, uh, but, you know, why don't you stay here? And Moses says, well, you know, that's probably not a good idea. That wouldn't be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? So there's an awareness of uh, Moses and the people of God that the very things that they're doing to, uh, to worship God are actually a protest against the Egyptians, that the Egyptians would have a problem with this. Uh, and for them to take uh, a, a, the baby version of the ram, their greatest god that they worshipped, and to take the baby version of that and to do it in such big ways, you know, God says, this is the way that you will be freed. You will take their God, you will kill it, you will eat it, and you're going to make a big deal about this. Because think about this. You're going to take a high set branch and you're going to paint the top and the sides. You're going to go across and you're going to go down uh, on this doorpost with the blood of that God, of that lamb that they, that they uh, would worship. And this has to be a very big event. You're going to do this at twilight when it's dark. All right, it's getting dark, and that's when you're going to actually start burning this, and you're going to burn the whole thing. You're not going to throw away parts of it. You're not going to uh, leave parts of it undone. You're going to do the entire animal, and you're going to eat all of it, and you're going to, uh, you know, use these flames, build a big fire. Think about it. It's, it's twilight. Everybody is going to see. They didn't have modern lighting like we have today. Everybody is going to see this giant bonfire that is, is designed to burn this animal, uh, and they're going to smell it. 
it's going to smell so rich and so strong because the animal fat, you know, it has that really strong, pungent kind of smell. Um, and the people are going to hear it too. They're going to hear all the people who are gathered for this ceremony. And think about how they were told to eat this animal also. Uh, it wasn't that they were supposed to sit down and recline and eat it quietly someplace, but instead they were supposed to get dressed up. They were supposed to be ready to go. Um, they weren't supposed to be in a position of a slave bowed down. They were supposed to be standing up like a full free person of the time. They were supposed to be tall, ready with their staff. They were ready to go, ready for their liberation, for their freedom. They were supposed to eat at attention. This wasn't a posture of slavery. This wasn't a posture of people who were, who were uh, content with staying where they were in the oppression that they were in. This was a people that God was preparing to go on the move. It was a symbolic act to face their oppressors. Now, it's interesting because in Passover tradition, uh, they would uh, share a Jewish prayer. It was um, the Hillel. And it was the, it's the verbatim recitation of Psalms 113, uh, 113 to 118. And um, it was, it's still recited by observant Jews on Jewish holidays uh, for an act of praise and thanksgiving. Um, this Hillel, uh, it was honoring not just the cost of your own people, but also the cost on the other side also. Uh, it was awareness of the terrible things that have happened uh, to our people, and it was the cost on all sides, not just celebration for how we have uh, found victory, but also the loss that was ensued in in the um, the ongoing difficulties. And so they would they would read from Psalm one thirteen to one eighteen uh, during their Passover time. Now, as Leonard Sweet points out about this uh, this passage. He calls it uh, biblical politics. Uh, they don't buy into the gods of the world. This is one of those places where we remember that the politics of God are not the politics of our world. Uh, they do not align. It's not uh, you know, any one country that uh, God is ordaining here, but God is actually critiquing the politics of the world, the gods that we make of our own nations. Um, in our current world, we often think of politics and political religions that they're such a mark of our current world, our nations and our nation states, faith and civil religion, they're mixed up to the point where we can't recognize the difference between them often. And even our, our two political uh, groups here in the United States, we might call them political denominations because people are sold out uh, and are saved by their politics. You know, they often think of in terms of their politics as leading the way rather than their own faith. Um, now, we, we often think of this division between these two also and that it's deepening here in, in our United States because there are also many different ways to follow Jesus. And there are many different ways to peace and justice. Politics is about the means and Jesus is about the ends. The goals, Jesus is about the overarching goal of love, the big picture that God calls us to. And the ends is love that we always have to come back to. But you've got to remember, there's, there are books written about love and how we love. There's even like the five love languages because there's lots of ways to love. We don't all agree on what is the right way to love. And sometimes even in you trying to love me, I, I may not, be able to feel that love. And if I'm trying to love you, I may be honestly trying to help, but you may not feel the kind of love that I'm offering to you. And it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to live in the way of love. And uh, our politics, when they become religion, they, they really do get in the way of this larger call that we all have to love. There's a lot of ways that we can love. Uh, and politics shouldn't become an idol. You know, we, we think of that in these, these older stories about the idols that, that people would worship. Uh, and the Egyptian gods, they, they were worshiping the Egyptian gods like idols. And so here we have God telling the, the people of God, take this idol, this, uh, this god, the, the, this baby version of the full-grown ram, and consume it fully. 
and do so in a big spectacle of a way. Take his blood, put it on your doorstep uh, so that everybody can see it and it's lasting. And in the morning, burn the rest of it up and make sure that it's all gone. So this is an ongoing, big, massive statement that God is making, that, that God is having the people of God do at this time, big political statement. Now, Jesus wasn't a political savior either, but Jesus was more, more radical than probably any other political person. Uh, he, during that time, they had the Hillel and they had Shabbat. Uh, he didn't pick a side in the debates of which school of thought they should be a part of. Instead, he was uh, creating new words and he was coming up with new concepts of how the people uh, could understand what they were doing. He was bridging between old party lines. Now, do we believe that having the right religion or the right politics or the right president is what is going to save us? Uh, what brings real change in the world is the change in our hearts, the change in our minds, the change in the way we function in the world, a change of who I am and how I am in the world. And we're not all called to the same needs. We're not all called to do the same things. But the kingdom of God is built on love and it is built through us as we each follow God and determine the gifts that God has given to us and then live out and help to grow the kingdom of God, make it a reality in our souls and in our world even today. That's the way that we make change. It's not through uh, a single issue. It's not through a certain political party. It is through us changing our heart, following along with Jesus Christ because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we are as Christians. Give the government your vote, give the government your taxes, but give God your heart. Follow God in all that you do. That is the way to bring the kingdom of God and all that is right in the world into our world is to bring Jesus Christ into our heart, into our lives. Now think about that, that uh, blood that was that was put on the doorstep for a second and think about that it was it was told to go across the top and it was told to go down the side that's the shape of the cross to go across and to go down and what better way to remember this symbol of what we are supposed to be about opposite our politics opposite our country opposite our nation we are supposed to live out this radical love of Jesus Christ in our world. And the sign to look for is the cross. Just like at this time, the Egyptian people, they built this cross on their door long before we hear the story of Jesus later coming. The blood of the cross is on their door. The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed mirrors this blood of the cross that was on their door at that time. It was this bloody cross that uh, Peter wanted to stop from happening when he was standing there in the garden with Jesus and wanted to take off the soldier's ear and, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. This is not uh, about starting a political revolution. This is about starting a revolution of love in our world, a whole different way, whole different words. I'm not subscribing to anything that we have here on earth at this time. The cross, it was an executioner device. This was a symbol of anti-religious sentiment. Uh, it was political. The cross itself at the time was a political statement because it was a power, a tool that was used by the politics of the time. And today, what we look at it when we see it, we see the humanity connecting with God when we see the cross. God transformed this image of the cross into something today that we can follow, a revolution of love, transforming, overcoming the politics of the day. This is a story that even back in this story in Exodus, we see starting to live out this, this metaphor of love, this metaphor and symbol, the crux of the suffering love of God that is literally the cross the blood giving God, the blood donor God, the God who the victory of the cross was actually not a victory for Jesus Christ himself, but the victory was in the suffering and of the giving up the political symbol of the suffering love. Sacrifice is what is best for me and for others. Politics is not sacrifice. Our love is sacrifice. The shadow of the cross is the kingdom of God. 
The way of the cross, it leads home for us. It's the most famous structure that was ever built and will ever be remembered in time. Uh, it was a political uh, symbol in history that was transformed into a political revolution of love that's still surging today. We are a people of our faith. And this revolution that we follow, it's not this or that. It has nothing to do with contemporary things that are going on, except it has everything to do with contemporary things that are going on. It's time to join deeply into a political revolution, a revolution of love with Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, as we hear these scriptures and as we um, reflect on this revolution that you called the people of God to do back in all those days in Exodus uh, to show their oppressors uh, to rally against and to make a spectacle out of uh, what was the current day's uh, politics and ways of being. Um, God, you were trying to show them a different and new way. And while even then they didn't totally understand what was going on, and even then back in all those days, they, um, they couldn't always follow in the way that you called them to, you were trying to teach us a different way. And we, we recognize that um, we're still trying to learn your way. That all these years later, we still uh, fall into some of the old uh, designs that are there, the, some of the old ways of being that are there, uh, because we, we try to think that what we can do is make things right, that we can um, fix things with uh, one election, that we can fix things with one uh, lobbying group, that we can fix things by uh, doing things a certain way or by being a part of a certain country. And God, you remind us in, in statements like this that it's really just not about all those things. That the revolution happens within us. The single issue that we might care about, it happens as we change our hearts. And then as we get involved and we take action in the things that uh, are really truly important to you. And that is, um, you know, caring for those who are oppressed, caring for those who are widows, caring for those who are orphans, caring for those who are foreigners, caring for those who uh, are in prisons, caring for those who are ill, for those who are poor. Uh, God, you, you give us these lists uh, and you repeat them over and over again to us, reminding us of what we're supposed to be about. And God, we try to accomplish that in many different ways. We know that by working together, we can accomplish more and we try to do that. Uh, but always remind us that ultimately, more than anything, your way is a way of love and that your words are a way of love and that anything that takes us away from that love is not the way. Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus Christ, not an issue, not an idea. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. That is our path to follow. That is our pattern to follow. That is our human being that we follow after. We pattern ourselves in those ways. Help us not to get caught up in those things that take us away from just learning to simply live and simply find ways to live with one another in greater peace and in greater love, with greater forgiveness. God, all of these things uh, help change our hearts so that we can actually hear your voice in the middle of all of it. It is difficult. We. We admit it is difficult sometimes, but God help us to realign ourselves and to follow in your ways. In Jesus Christ, we pray and we give you thanks. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week and may you have a resilient week.